Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For as we are warned and encouraged by the Apostle John, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Amen. History and Prophecy in the News for the week of March 20-26 March 22, 1945, the Arab League, a loose confederation of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Transjordan, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen, was formed in Cairo for the purpose of securing Arab unity. Others joined later. Libya, Sudan, Tunisia, Morocco, Kuwait, Algeria, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. Now, does that sound a little familiar from our news today? This was in 1945, and what's happening in those very nations today, all the way from Libya, uh, Tunisia, uh, Saudi Arabia beginning to happen, all across there. What's happening? And consider this from history of the Arab League, which was actually a foreshadow of the King of the South, as we covered in our sermon recently. Isn't it amazing how these little foreshadows of things happen, just sort of waiting for their time? It's like a multi-stage growth. It's the roots sort of take their turn of growth so that when the time grows to grow the trunk and the branches and everything else everything's there the roots are there the reason is there and a lot of times history you know old grudges that went on for centuries um, World War One actually was triggered uh, no pun intended by a very old grudge we'll put the link on for the European World Wars and how that continued on and really the Second World War was just a continuation of unfinished business in the minds of a lot of people and how old grudges oftentimes that existed or original events that happened even before people were even born but they're brought up with the hate of their parents and grandparents or grudges or just whatever can bring and oftentimes it's just a political thing where a leader will if they can just find some boogeyman somewhere out there it's to the leader's benefit because the people well they're not going to they can ignore a lot of corruption and evil in the in their own leader leader's behavior if there's just a boogeyman out there because we have to do this now to protect us from the boogeyman and the Arab nations of course the boogeyman is the western nations and oftentimes from the western nations considering terrorism to the western nations the the, the Arab nations are the boogeyman so everybody's got a boogeyman now and oftentimes uh, as is often the case it's going to come together king of the north king of the south and the western nations are just not going to be able to do much about it because they're bankrupt. Uh, Britain right now cutting back on um, military spending. Uh, the United States hasn't yet, but that's can't go on much longer because the read the the articles coming out of uh, people in the United States, government leaders, economists, uh, people in business. They understand that the debt just can't go on because it it actually in itself is becoming the number one national security threat. The debt. And, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, why don't we just print the money? Let's just, why not do that? Well, you know, why don't they then? I mean, governments, you know, if it, if it was just a matter of solving economic problems by printing money, why not, why doesn't the government just print everybody a million dollars the day you're born and make you a millionaire and make everybody happy? Give everybody a million dollars the day they're born. Why don't they do that if, the, if governments could just do that? And the answer is they can't because money would become worthless. If you give everybody a million dollars, a million dollars would be worth about a dollar. That's really the value of it, because it would have no value. It would become worthless. And 
That's what happened actually that triggered the First World War, the result of it, because Germany was given, sort of given the bill for the First World War. The debt was hopelessly impossible to pay off, so they just let inflation take off. They started printing money. Money became worthless. You know, the very famous incident where a man went to a bakery to buy bread, and the money was so worthless, he literally had a, a wheelbarrow full of cash, money. It was worthless. And he couldn't get the wheelbarrow through the door of the bakery, so he just left it outside, thinking, well, nobody's going to steal it because it's not worth anything. And he was right. He came in, he, he went in and got the baker, and he was going to pay the man for the bread. And he came out, and the money was strewn all over the sidewalk. Nobody stole it. He was quite right. But they stole his wheelbarrow. You know, they threw the money, you know, this huge mound of money that was worthless. And that's the reason they don't and can't. So you can see the economics of things. You can't deny it. You're, you're going to hit the wall sooner or later, and all these things eventually, it's just going to come around to fulfill the things in prophecy that we read about. And the King of the South, and as we said, the foreshadows of things, the Arab League is certainly one of them. March 21, 1935, Persia was renamed Iran. Isn't that amazing? Uh, Persia and Iran very ancient country. We had, did a sermon, a study recently about the origin of Purim, which was in Persia. Did you know at one time, considering the, the difference of, of the hatred between Iran and, and Israel today, did you know that one time a Jew was the queen of Iran or queen of Persia? Her name was Esther. There's a book in the Bible about her. Uh, we'll put the link on for that as well. How those things go around. Persia right now, or Iran, they haven't been attacked because they are militarily powerful, whereas the other nations, uh, although very rich, the Arab nations, they have not been militarily powerful. And so the result is, again, you know, in the world as, it's, as, it's, as it is, uh, people aren't nice. Countries aren't nice. They're going to take whoever, you know, big fish eat little fish. It's just the way it's always been. Well, there are examples as well, perhaps in the modern day world, as a statement of the way the world is today. We saw uh, a YouTube video about a bullying incident. I think it was from Australia, where this one kid was picking on the other kid, and you'd think, well, the bully was the big one. But it's an amazing thing. The, the bully was actually a kid maybe half the size, or roughly half the size of the one he was picking on, and he was beating on this, this other kid. He wasn't just taunting him. He was actually punching him in the face, at least a couple times it's shown on the video, and it's just an amazing thing. This, the bully was like half the size of the one he was picking on, until finally the bigger kid just picked the other, picked the bully up and sort of body slammed him into the ground. And apparently they were, there's a big discussion now about that because they were both uh, apparently suspended from school for fighting when one was obviously a very clear case of self-defense, at least from the video. We don't know what was leading up to it or why the little one got so, uh, seems to be so brave. Maybe, you know, he'd been taunted and picked on by the bigger one and when you're mad, you, you sort of lose your fear. But from what's on that video it's thing, it's just, it was an amazing thing that, you know, the little one was really picking on the bigger one. Here's one that people should have learned by um, if considering who it was and the connection to some of the actual Church of God people or branches that came out of this. March 21, 1844 was the date set by Adventist, quote-unquote, founder William Miller for the day of Christ's return. When his prediction failed, he set a new date, October 22nd of that same year, which also failed, becoming known as the Great Disappointment. Now, what was his mistake? Actually, two of them. But number one, he was contradicting the word of Jesus Christ when Christ said that even he didn't know when it was going to be. Only the Father decides when it's going to happen. But number two, there is only one thing in the Bible, one event, plain as day in the Bible, that tells us when the return of Jesus Christ isn't. And I can say this from the Bible today. I'll give me an example. I know from the Bible that Jesus Christ's return is not going to happen within 42 months of today. I know that for a fact. I don't know when it's going to be, but I know when it isn't. And it's not going to be within 42 months of today. And how do I know that? Because the miraculous ministry of the two witnesses has not happened. They have not appeared in the world. And we know from the Word of God that Christ's return will occur on the day, a few days, after their martyrdom and their martyrdom will come after their 42-month miraculous ministry. So until they appear, if they appear tomorrow, then Christ's return would be 42 months away. If it comes, if they were to appear a year from now, then it would be 42 months from that. 
It's a pretty sure thing. But Mr. Miller here just sort of ignored what? Well, he ignored the Bible. His followers did as well. And he misled a lot of people. Because why? Well, number one, he wasn't reading the Bible, and obviously those who followed him weren't either, or else they would have known that. You don't have to be a prophet to know to read what's there, you know, or they even have the understanding of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand things. Although, perhaps the understanding of the Holy Spirit includes being able to recognize or accept what the Bible says without ignoring it or having some man change it for you or mislead you. But because it's, it's very easy. And it, so many of the things, you know, the Bible is in itself so easy if, if you actually read it. It amazes me as well how many people don't read it and claim to be Christian. I mean, even haven't begun to read it yet. I know it can be seem like a very difficult task, but really it isn't. You know, you can read the Bible. Uh, my own readings, I can read it once in 40 days without really putting much of a, a really big hole in the day. You know, in half an hour, 45 minutes a day, and you know, considering what people spend their time on, otherwise, you know, watching some TV show, you know, consider how much better you would time and you can be done the whole Bible in, in 40 days you know it doesn't take long or even a year, our, our year long uh, study plan a few minutes it doesn't take very long it should take longer than that if you really you don't want to just sort of breeze through it without really realizing and appreciating and understanding and accepting what's there but you know it, it doesn't take long to read the Bible but many people just don't ever start the thing is you, you have to start and then when you do you'll be amazed at what you'll read and understand the first time. And then even more the second time, and even more the third time, because it's like it's like walking up the stairs. With each step, you can see more, because you've gone up one step. And then when you go up another step, you can see even more again, and more again, and more again. It's all there for you. March 21, 1871, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck opened the first, first Reichstag in the newly created German Reich. And as we covered in last week's sermon in our news item, uh, why we make the connection between the Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire, and the so-called Holy Roman Empire, which is the full title was the Holy Roman Empire, the German nation. And when they stopped calling it that, they started calling it the German Reich. And Hitler, of course, by the time we got to him, was the Third Reich. And there's a Fourth Reich coming. March 21, 1933, the opening ceremony of the first setting of the Reichstag during the reign of Adolf Hitler. Now consider this one. I'll just read the first part of it. Tell me, take a guess when this happened. Nazis firebombed a synagogue in Lubeck, Germany. When do you suppose that happened? Nazis firebombed a synagogue in Lubeck, Germany. Now, probably they did it in the time of Hitler, but this wasn't in the time of Hitler. This was in 1994, a few years ago. March 25, 1994, Nazis firebombed a synagogue in Lubeck, Germany. It is believed the first such incident in Germany since the end of the Second World War. Does Hitler? Does history repeat itself? I was going to I almost slipped and said, does Hitler repeat himself? And he does. That's probably why it slipped. History repeats itself. Hitler repeats itself. It's coming. And here's one of the proof. I mean, Nazis firebombed a synagogue in Lubeck, Germany a few years ago. March 23, 1324, Louis IV, Emperor of Germany, was excommunicated by Pope John XXII. And consider this one. March 23, 1534, Pope Clement declared the marriage between Henry VIII of England and Catherine of Aragon was still valid. The marriage was dissolved the previous year, and Henry had married Anne Boleyn. Now, the Pope, he's sort of been in a lot of people's business across Europe and in Britain, and, uh, hasn't he? making declarations to kings, claiming that. Here's another one. March 21, 1556, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, was burned at the stake as a heretic. And interestingly, you know, as well, heretics to one to the other is really just a rejection, not of doctrine, a biblical doctrine, because neither of them really have any biblical doctrine, but just rejection of which leader, whether it be Catholic or Protestant. But all that, you know, the struggle that they've had, the Catholics killing Protestants, some of the most horrendous slaughters of people. It wasn't just a matter of killing someone, but they just tortured them. Just incredible viciousness, savagery, brutality that humans can inflict on one another. 
you know, it, it isn't. It's just amazing that someone has to do that. You know, if you if you have to kill somebody in, in self-defense, or if you're a soldier at war, you know, doing your job is one thing, but torturing people and just cutting, you know, some of the things that were done to the Lord's prophets, even by people who were given to be God's people. You know, the the things that happened. We we did a recent study about Manasseh, the king of Judah, the brutality that that man did to his own people while at the very same time being threatened from the outside. It, it was just absolutely amazing. There is no record of it in the Bible, but there is uh, a Jewish tradition that the prophet Isaiah was sawn in two. While alive, obviously he didn't survive it, but he was alive when they started during the reign of Manasseh. And why do you suppose it is that the Lord brought his wrath upon Manasseh after the things that he did, not only to his own people, but to his own prophets. It wasn't just rejecting the word, but rejecting the very thing that people were given to understand and to be. The amazingness of it, the arrogance of that. You know, in this world, the time is coming. When you, if you're an arrogant person, you're like walking around with a great big crush me sign on the top of your head, because the Lord's going to do it. Because arrogance is satanic. We're just people. You know, people are people. And the things that, considering what humans have done to each other, in the name of God, in Christ's own name, that is the top of it. But consider how, as well, how Protestants and Catholics, at least, are going to stop killing each other. They're going to start being really nice to each other in the end time. That doesn't mean they're going to get rid of their hatred and their viciousness, because then they're going to be united against those who actually believe what's in this book. Consider this. You talk about roots being planted. Here's another one. Or uprooted, perhaps, because the so-called Protestant Reformation. Well, consider this. March 23, 1966, the Archbishop of Canterbury met the Pope in Rome. It was the first meeting between the heads of the Anglican and Roman churches in 400 years. And they, since that time, since 1966, they pretty much have united again. In everything but name, uh, the Church of Rome is making it very easy for them. And why wouldn't they? It doesn't matter. As long as you don't believe the Bible, then you can be as much a part of Mother Rome as anything, because they don't believe in it either. You know, the harlot and the mother of harlots, you know, that's very true. But consider, you know, that they're still human, the human nature. And when we read of the, the amount of persecution, the great tribulation on God's people, you can see where it's going to happen. And it isn't as though the people are evil. They're just deceived, the deception. They're willingly deceived, like Miller's people just blindly followed a man because well he might have been impressive or perhaps he was very charismatic perhaps he was able to to get people to listen perhaps they liked to listen to the man but the fact is he was either wrong or lying to them and that's a dangerous combination isn't it charisma and lack of understanding or apostasy one or the other can lead a lot of people in the wrong direction and that's unfortunate but sometimes even, you know, the creation of Henry's church there, but consider the good things sometimes that can happen despite of it. March 24, 1603, Elizabeth I, the Queen of England, for over 40 years died. She was succeeded by James VI of Scotland, who acceded the throne as James I, uniting the thrones of Scotland and England. And James I is after him or from him that we get the name King James Bible. So, you know, the goodness of it. But as well, you know, the translators of the King James Bible were Sunday keepers, Easter keepers. They put the very infamous Easter in there, in one place, just one, when in fact they knew very well it was Passover because they translated it as such everywhere else. But they just threw that in. It was a blatant mistranslation. They knew very well. So they were Sunday keepers. So, but despite themselves, there they were, able to do something that some good can, can come from, even though most people own the Bible don't read it. So, you know, it's there. The old saying, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can lead a so-called Christian to the Bible, but you can't make her, him or her read it either. That takes a little more effort within themselves by the Holy Spirit when it comes. And consider March 26, 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte captured Jaffa, Palestine. And, March 26, 1917, at the start of the Battle of Gaza, British cavalry under Murray withdrew when 17,000 Turks blocked their advance. 
and that was the Ottoman Empire, how the empires have fought over the so-called Holy Land. People call it the Holy Land. That's not what Christ calls it. He calls it Sodom and Egypt because, you know, they still reject him. They don't understand either. It isn't a matter... You know, a lot of Christian professing people look at the people of Judah, those who don't yet recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God and as the Messiah. And they, they feel very sorry for him and all the anti-Semitism and everything. But, you know... Most Christian professing people, they don't accept Christ any more than the, pe the non-Messianic people of Judah do. They do in name, but, but they don't really accept him. You know, if Jesus Christ was to walk into a Sunday-keeping church and do a sermon, I don't think he would be able to finish. I think they'd throw him out. I really do, because I think what they, based on what we know he would say, based on what he already said is read in the Bible, you know, he would tell them the truth, and I don't think they'd like it. And I know that from personal experience here as well. All Sunday people, they'll feel sorry for you. Oh, you're a poor Old Testament Sabbath keeping, keeping the Jews Sabbath, and on and on and on it goes. But if you ever get them in something where they don't have an answer, they get really mad very fast. And, you know, it, it, it's something that the truth happens to them. You know, they sort of hit the wall on the truth. That's when they get dangerous. I've known there, there are a lot of days when I'm really glad that this ministry is internet. I really am, because a lot of the good Christian people out there, I think they're dangerous. A lot of them are. And in the end time, you know, when they once the Pope's miracles start and all the rest of it, it's going to get a whole lot worse. They're actually going to go out of the way and start hunting Christians. Just as, for example, the Apostle Paul. I mean, look, at the, I use him as an example, but he's a prime example of how in his zeal for the Lord, this Pharisee actually went way out of his way, literally way out of his way, to hunt down Christians kill them, throw them in prison, torture them, do all sorts of things in the name of the Lord. And the Lord one day knocked him down on the road to Damascus. He was walking around with a crush me sign on the top of his head as well. So the Lord gave him what he was needing in order to bring him around to what he was going to do from that time on. And you know, his understanding, his knowledge as a Pharisee, it wasn't wasted. He was able to read most of the New Testament, you know, the last half of the book of Acts, at least more of it, but the last two-thirds is about Paul, and most of the epistles written by Paul, the ministry of Paul, and this Pharisee, a man who started out, as we first read about him, as someone who was killing Christians. But he didn't understand. And when he did, he repented, stopped it, and lived his life in a useful way, in the service of Christ. And ironically, almost from the very day he began, he began being persecuted by the very same people who were once with him in persecuting Christians, his fellow Pharisees, the so-called religious council. So people aren't hopeless. They're not lost until such time that they, they decide to be, knowingly decide to be. And Paul repented, just as we all have when we came to understand the truth. You know, we jettisoned Sunday and Easter and all the nonsense, Christmas, the Roman calendar, which we're stuck with, we can't really do much about that, but New Year's, the Roman New Year in the middle of winter, just on and on and on and on it goes, but we can take comfort in the fact that we know it's going to come to an end. All of that, the calendar. Here's one that has evolved the calendar as well. March 21, 1656, James Usher, Archbishop, died at age 76. He calculated the famous calculation that the world began in 4004 BC. We'll put the link on for that. The Bible doesn't say the world was that young. Uh, a lot of Christian professing people believe it. They think, well, to deny that error uh, is to somehow accept evolution. And we don't here because the Bible very plainly says the Bible, the world and the universe itself is much older than that. We'll put the link on for the study that we did on that. Uh, as well, or the sermon that we did on that, as well as the sermon about evolution. And considering this, on March 23, 1925, Tennessee banned the teaching of evolution in schools. Teacher John Scopes ignored the ban and was later prosecuted in what became known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, and the, the mocking and so on. A lot of people, uh, again, are defenders of the Bible without ever having read it. Uh, that when they banned evolution there. There's a lot of other places as well. That was one of the most famous, the Scopes trial in Tennessee. But, you know, the, Mr. Scopes, I don't think he read the Bible. I don't. I doubt it very much. And the people who, who read, 
who made the law probably didn't read it either. Or if they did, they were good Sunday-keeping people. They weren't bad people. But again, like we asked, they just didn't understand yet. And if you don't understand, how can you know? And if you don't know, how can you do what you need to be doing? And the world is, that's just the state of the world right now. It, it means, and we understand that, don't we? Because we were there. That's the Babylon that we came out of. Babylon, you know, just means, it's, it's the same word that from which we get babble. And the, that in itself is a word that comes from baby. It's what babies do. They babble. They, don't, they make noise, and they think they're talking, apparently, but they don't really, they're not saying anything. They're pretty happy, and they, they like it, as they babble, but they're not saying anything of any understanding, are they? And that's pretty much the state of the world right now. So the world has compassion, just as we must, on those who don't quite understand yet. Because there was a time when we didn't, and we wouldn't want someone treating us with disdain or cruelty, when we didn't know any better, would we? Even though somebody may have done so, but it isn't necessary to be like that. There's lots to do, and just to ignore unfortunate people who just haven't had the time, given their time yet, and that's really what it takes by means of the Holy Spirit. So, it's all going to happen. It's all going to come around. It's all going to work. It's not going to be an easy ride to the end, as we'll deal with in our sermon today about earthquakes, you know, a lot of time. But even the earthquakes have, are going to have a purpose. They're part of the construction of a new world. In order to, and in order to construct something new, you oftentimes have to move things out of the way, things that are in the way. And we'll deal with that in our sermon because the kingdom of God is coming, in which truth and light and all humanity's nonsense, this babbling, the little children are going to be grown up. They're going to be born in the kingdom of God as adults. You don't have to worry about being a little infant again. When we were born the second time, truly, put the link on for born again, it isn't going to be as a baby. We're going to be born into the knowledge and adulthood of our Father. We're going to be very much children of God then as well, truly in His own image, in His own awareness of the truth, because we're going to be as much in the truth as his children as he is because we wouldn't be his children otherwise would we right now we're not quite children of God are we we're sort of gestating toward that birth but right now we're just not there yet and we're still physical and we're still having to do what we must do in order to get there but we will because we know we've been given enough to know to get us to where we need to be thy kingdom come and it surely is Our sermon this week is about earthquakes in history and in prophecy and a little bit of hopefully helpful information about earthquakes that we've obtained from some official sources in case you happen to be in one 
where you live or if you're somewhere where an earthquake occurs. We put on, uh, actually, the, we try to get the titles um, planning sermons uh, at least a few weeks ahead, and you may have noticed we had the earthquake one on, I think it was over a month ago, four or five weeks, and some people thought, well, that's rather ironic considering the big earthquake that happened in Japan, but really it wasn't because, you know, you can say, well, there's a great earthquake coming. You want to make, you want to be an easy prophet, uh, just say, well, there's a big earthquake coming. And don't say where, just say there's a big earthquake coming, and before long, you'll be right, because earthquakes happen all over the world, all the time. They're caused by a very natural force in the earth, of the earth, as it was created. This is from the Concise Columbia Encyclopedia, a brief article just what causes earthquakes. Quote, trembling or shaking movement of the earth's surface. Great earthquakes usually begin with slight tremors, rapidly increase to one or more violent shocks, and diminish gradually. The immediate cause of most shallow earthquakes is the sudden release of stress along a fault or fracture in the earth's crust, resulting in the movement of opposing blocks of rock past one another. This causes vibrations to pass through and around the earth in waveform. The subterranean origin of an earthquake is its focus. The point on the surface directly above the focus is the epicenter. Waves generated by earthquakes are of three types. Both P or primary waves are the compressional and are the fastest, and S or secondary waves which cause vibrations perpendicular to their motion are body waves that pass through the earth. L or long waves travel along the surface and cause damage near the epicenter. Seismologists have deduce the internal structure of the earth by analyzing changes in P and S waves. The magnitude and intensity of earthquakes are determined by the use of scales, such as the Richter scale, which describes the amount of energy released at the focus of an earthquake. So just a very brief article there. Just to explain it, if you happen to live along an earthquake fault, these great plates of the earth's surface, if you happen to live near one where there are these rock islands, if you will, of the earth's surface, pass one under the other, and as they're doing so, they sort of grab a hold until eventually that, f that power that's building up is released and all the energy is released and the earth shakes. And you're more likely to be in an area, if you're in an area where those faults are, then you are more subject to earthquakes. And of course, there are a lot of them. Most of them have been well documented. People know where they are. The, the scientists know where they are. Uh, if you happen to live around the coast of the east coast of Asia or the west coast of the United States and North America, Canada, uh, and down South America, you understand what earthquakes are, don't you? Because that's that's one major known fault area. Whereas in closer inland, although there are exceptions, actually, uh, the New Madrid Fault along the Mississippi being a primary one, but generally speaking, inland, you don't have as many earthquakes. Here, for example, in, we do get earthquakes in Canada, particularly in west on the west coast of Canada, but here in southern Ontario, uh, I've lived here for 56 years. I don't, I've only experienced one earthquake here. And even then, it was so almost nothing that I didn't even know what it was until I read about it in the newspaper the next day. I remember I felt it. it was, I was working, uh, and there was a light. I just sort of felt sort of a queasy feeling. And then there was a hanging fluorescent light fixture from the ceiling, and it moved a little bit. And I thought, isn't that strange? But I, it never occurred to me that it was an earthquake. I read about it the next morning. But that's it. Whereas people, if you live in along uh, in Japan, which is almost a daily threat to them, they're thinking about it all the time, they're really well prepared, and yet the devastation, once it comes, can be far more than anybody can prepare for. And also, that's an important point, in that we have a list here, actually, um, this is from the Lamont Doherty Cooperative Seismographic Network, and it has a listing of the greatest earthquakes, and there's two lists, two lists. Now, why would that be? Do they disagree? Well, no, they're based on two different things. One is the actual power of the earthquake. As, as on the Richter scale, and the other is the loss of life. And the two lists don't match, because if a great earthquake happens out in an area where there is no great cities or large population density, obviously there's not, even though it can be a huge earthquake, it can be a record earthquake, as in fact we have here, we'll just go down this list briefly, it's not going to cause a great loss of life, where a relatively smaller earthquake in a huge metropolitan area, highly populated area, can cause more damage and injury and, and loss of life. Consider this. This is from 
the largest earthquakes in history. This list by the Lamont Lodority Cooperative Seismographic Network. This is by magnitude. The, the number one was magnitude 9.5 on the Richter scale. It was in Chile in 1960, and 1,655 people were, were killed. Now just compare that to some of the greater great loss of life earthquakes as we'll get to. But the greatest earthquake on record measured 9.5 on the Richter scale, 1,655 people died. Whereas, for example, at the top of the other list, by death toll, the number one earthquake occurred in China in 1556, 830,000 people died. A huge difference, because it was in a populated area. But this is just the magnitude records. Uh, as we said, the one in Chile in 1960, magnitude 9.5. The second is in 1964, magnitude 9.2 in Prince William Sound, Alaska. Number three was in 2004, magnitude 9.1 off the west coast of northern Sumatra. Number four was in 2011, mag ni magnitude 9.0. That is the one uh, that has just occurred near the coast of Honshu, Japan. Number five was in 1952, magnitude 9.0 in Kumchatka, Russia. Number six was in 2010, magnitude 8.8 .8 offshore of Chile. Number seven was in 1906, magnitude 8.8 .8 near Colombia, Ecuador border. So those, and those, the, the death tolls for those, all of these were relatively small. But consider now the other list by death toll, and again, populated areas, and not necessarily populated areas in the modern world, because the one in 1556 obviously was not the modern world. 830,000 people in China died. And the second worst on record was also in China in 1976. The estimates vary, but around 750,000 people died. And number three was in Haiti, just recently in 2010, where over 300,000 people died. So you can see the differences here, but again, going back, you want to go back in history, here's another one. Number four was in, five, in the year 526 in Turkey, in which 250,000 people were killed. So it's not only just the magnitude of the earthquake, but where it happens as well. Because there, you know a huge earthquake in a remote area, obviously, is not going to be a problem as much. It's going to cause damage and everything. And just as a little bit of public service here, we, well, this is from the from FEMA in the United States, the Federal Emergency Organization. What to do during an earthquake? Just some helpful information because chances are you're going to need this sooner or later, particularly if you happen to be living in the end time. Quote, stay as safe as possible during an earthquake. Be aware that some earthquakes are actually foreshocks and a larger earthquake might occur. Minimize your movements to a few steps to a nearby safe place and if you are indoors, stay there until the shaking has stopped and you are sure exiting is safe. If indoors, drop to the ground, take cover by getting under a sturdy table or other piece of furniture and hold on until the shaking stops. If there isn't a table or desk near you, cover your face and head with your arms and crouch in an inside corner of the building. Stay away from glass, windows, outside doors and walls, and anything that could fall, such as lighting fixtures or furniture. Stay in bed if you are there when the earthquake strikes. Hold on and protect your head with a pillow unless you are under a heavy light fixture that could fall. In that case, move to the nearest safe place. Use a doorway for shelter only if it is in close proximity to you and if you know it is a strongly supported load-bearing doorway. Stay inside until the shaking stops and it is safe to go outside. Research has shown that most injuries occur when people inside buildings attempt to move to a different location inside the building or try to leave. Be aware that electricity may go out or the sprinkler systems or fire alarms may turn on. Do not use the elevators. Though well, most of those uh, are common sense. Continuing, if outdoors, stay there. Move away from buildings, street lights, and utility wires. Once in the open, stay there until the shaking stops. The greatest danger exists directly outside buildings, at exits, and alongside exterior walls. Many of the 120 fatalities from the 1933 Long Beach earthquake occurred when people ran outside of buildings only to be killed by falling debris from collapsing walls. Ground movement during an earthquake is seldom the direct cause of death or injury. Most earthquake-related casualties result from collapsing walls, flying glass, and falling objects.
If in a moving vehicle, stop as quickly as safety permits and stay in the vehicle. Avoid stopping near or under buildings, trees, overpasses, and utility wires. Proceed cautiously once the earthquake has stopped. Avoid roads, bridges, or ramps that might have been damaged by the quake. If trapped under debris, do not light a match. Do not move about or kick up dust. Cover your mouth with a handkerchief or clothing. Tap on a pipe or wall so rescuers can locate you. Use a whistle if one is available. Shout only as a last resort. Shouting can cause you to inhale dangerous amounts of dust. And I didn't mention there, but perhaps uh, if you're not buried too deeply, if you have a cell phone, as most people do nowadays, uh, perhaps that could help as well. Of course, if it's still working, that's another matter. And if you have a local area, probably um, if you live in an earthquake-prone area, you probably are very well aware uh, of those sorts of precautions. And even if you don't, you should be, because as we said, it, most people, for example, in North America, we think of the West Coast, along what the West Coast, whether it be along the coast of British Columbia and down the coast, California, the very San Andre, famous San Andreas Fault, of course. But one of the greatest earthquakes that occurred far from the West Coast, along the, the New Madrid Fault, along the Mississippi. And many seismologists believe there's going to be another major earthquake there. So it doesn't really matter much where you are, but the thing is, being prepared for a lot of things. A lot, Actually, a lot of these things can apply to really tornadoes, or they can apply to other sorts of natural disasters and things. So, And earthquakes are, for the most part, natural disasters. And certainly there's something well known from a long time. So having said that, uh, we can look at the Bible with a little bit of understanding, because as you said, some people thought it was rather almost prophetic that somehow we put earthquake on, and then there was the big earthquake in Japan, just uh, I think a week or two later, but really it was just a matter of you know, you can say an earthquake is coming and you're, you're bound to be right. You know, there's a big one coming no matter where you are. But in the Bible, that's what we're interested in because it tells us a lot of the things that are going to happen in the future involving earthquakes, how in fact one of the greatest prophecies of Christ's return also involves an earthquake, as we'll get to. But looking to the actual words of the scriptures in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew word pronounced ra'osh, which is translated as earthquake, means vibration or commotion, uh, as using the English language word, which is actually the, the commotion, uh, you know, the motion in commotion uh, word there. It's a sort of a hint of what it means, but it comes from a Latin uh, word, the English word does, the com meaning with and movio meaning to move. So commotion means to move. We often think of causing a commotion and everything, but natural commotions happen too. It simply means move. And in the New Testament, the Greek word pronounced seismos, and that sounds familiar, doesn't it? We hear the word seismic, and seismologists, people who study earthquakes, well, that's where the word came from, from that Greek word. That The word seismic and seismology are actually the word found in the New Testament Greek, and it also means to a commotion or to shake. And that's really what it is, isn't it? The earth shaking. And back then, you know, you didn't have to be a scientist to tell when an earthquake happened. They were something very common. And again, you know, the devastation, uh, even older cities, things are relative. You know, a city that's completely destroyed. If if you live in a city of, of 5 million people and your city is completely destroyed, that would just be a horrendous, total devastation, wouldn't it? But if you lived in a city of only 1,000 people, and if 1,000 people was a big city and it was destroyed, that's just as much traumatic to, to someone at that time. So as a matter of the effect upon people the earthquakes have had, there's not a lot of difference, as we said, and it, it happens no matter where they are. Actually, Israel, it's amazing there haven't been more, because the Jordan River, one of the most famous rivers in the world, exists because there is a great earthquake fault along the Jordan Valley, that's through which the water flows, making a river in there. But is underneath there an earthquake fault, and as we'll get to, one of the most famous events of and earthquakes of Christ's return will be caused by that, that great fault in there. You can see that actually the, the plate's moving. If you look at a map on the, of the Sinai, for example, you can see how it's splitting and moving. The plate tectonics, the moving of the plates, actually, if you look at the coast, the very, very well-known one of how the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, it's because they're moving. And that's you know been proven very plainly. Halfway across the ocean, now with modern technology, there is that great spreading zone where it's 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 a rift in that area, and it also follows the shape of those continents and matches it again. 
a little bit first a little bit of history and sort of stating in how the Lord can create an earthquake he has this absolute power and yet he speaks sort of like speaking softly and carrying a big earthquake to, to use the modern day term in a different sort of way Let's consider this example with Elijah 1 Kings 19 9 to 14 and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there and behold the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him what doest thou here Elijah and he said I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts for the the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thine prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him, and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thy altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, only I, am left, and they seek to take it away. And that, by the way, was at Mount Horeb, which was where the Ten Commandments were delivered. We'll put the link on for that, the 40-day fasts of how the Lord can thunder and power and yet have speak gently, because his word isn't about violence, it's about truth, it's about the ability to deal with the world, be gentle with the children, if you will, and yet have the force to defend them in the way and at that point Elijah Jezebel was after him trying to kill him and he just felt alone and if you're somebody who's living by the word of God you probably experience that you don't have to be a prophet you know just living you can live that have that experience in your own family if you're the only one called you can feel very alone but the understanding of it you know they're just reading the Bible that's that still small voice that's there of the Lord and yet he has absolute power the understanding and the knowledge that when all happens as well, you know, the earthquake, you know that Elijah wasn't hurt in that earthquake or in the wind or anything else because he was protected, and that's important to understand, particularly in the end time, as we'll get to. But consider this as well. Isaiah 29, 5-8. to Prophecy. Because most of the earthquakes, as we read of them in the Bible, are prophetic. Isaiah 29, 5-8, Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, and with earthquake, and great noise, with storm and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall be even as when an hungry man dreameth, and beholdeth he eateth, but he awaketh, and his soul is empty, as when a thirsty man dreameth, and behold he drinketh, but he awaketh, and behold he is faint, and his soul hath appetite, so shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. And Zion there, the understanding we'll put the link on for, anti-Zion is anti-Christ. It's more than just a physical place. Zion, the daughter of Zion, we'll put the link on for that, means the church, the church of God, the people, the daughter of Zion, the understanding that the, the people who are born from that law by means of obeying the law. A lot of people think, well, you can't, grace will get you salvation. Well, that's true. But grace is only granted to the obedient. You know, finish the sentence. Because... If that weren't, if it, all there was as matter was just grace, a free gift, you know, there'd be no lake of fire, would there? Why else are people in the lake of fire? Well, if they're not, isn't because they're refusing to repent and obey the Lord. But people, it's amazing to me how many Sunday keeping preachers preach grace. Nothing is to be done. You don't have to know anything. You don't have to do anything. And yet they preach hellfire, the silver burning hellfire. It's like on one hand, and they fail to make the connection. Why? It is. Most of them say, well, it's only because they haven't yet heard the name of Jesus, and if you just preach the name of Jesus, all you have to claim is Jesus for your Savior, and you're saved, and that's it. Well, no, not according to the word of Jesus. 
and unfortunately a lot of people who have yet to understand almost certainly almost absolutely almost certainly hate the truth because they have yet they've come to love a lie without even realizing it but consider this one as well how history and the prophecy connect Amos 1 1 to 2 the words of Amos who was among the herdmen of Tekoa which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah king of Judah and the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash king of Israel two years before the earthquake and he said the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither that's a prophetic statement based upon something that happened in the past and again another one and notice where it says there the roar, Lord will roar from Zion and you have the earthquake there's a connection there isn't it there? and that's talking about actually the drift, drift valley that travels up north along north through the all of, from farther south all along that area in there follows it along we'll put the link on actually for the map for earthquakes a very general map that's going to actually split the Mount of Olives as we said one of the most famous events of Christ's return is going to actually split that mountain Zechariah 14 4 to 9 and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south and to interject there it's literally going to move mountains and you know that isn't just some thing out of the Bible say well that's all just Bible fantasy and so on mountains being moved well the recent earthquake according to geologists Japan was moved over by 17 feet all of Japan was moved 17 feet by that earthquake so can the Lord move mountains can the earth move mountains and splitting the Mount of Olives you know compared you know is relatively nothing compared to the size of Japan so splitting the Mount of Olives and where all that water is going to come from under there it's both living waters it's spiritual spe spiritually speaking of the Holy Spirit but it's also literal waters I'll put the link on for that study continuing verse 5 and he shall flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azael yea shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee and to interject there that's you if you're a true Christian you're going to return with Christ you're going to be changed if you're alive that day or resurrected to spirit if you died since that time along with everybody else of God's true people from all of history going to be resurrected to meet the Lord in the air the obvious reason for that is because they're all around the earth they can't simply go up into one place because people on the other side would not be meeting him so it's going to be sort of like an orbit you're going to be you're going to orbit the earth you're going to be resurrected or changed to meet the Lord in the air do one complete orbit at least one and then touch down on the Mount of Olives which will then be split continuing verse 6 and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord not day nor night it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light and that shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day shall be one Lord and his name one and the hinder sea and the former sea is talking about the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean fresh water is going to flow in each of those two directions from under the Mount of Olives but also living waters means the Holy Spirit that will from that time go out from Zion and enable people to follow the law of the Lord which they have a lot of problems doing right now as we all have in the meantime as we've all experienced in, the, in our lives prior to our understanding it amazes me you know uh, particularly with Facebook now we're hearing from more and more people Sunday keeping people who read studies about the Sabbath who read the studies about Sunday who listen to the Sabbath sermons and yet they just they're like the, the people with the the hell hellfire on one side and grace gets you to heaven on the other it's just like the connection isn't made and it's the Holy Spirit that makes the connection for them they got a good heart and they get so offended if you if they if they ask a question and you know it's happening like it's, for me it's become like a daily experience now they ask their question 
I have to answer it according to what the Bible actually says, and they get offended. So it's bye-bye for you, as in bye-bye to me. One particular individual, um, Sunday Keeping, last week, on the Facebook, he defriended me and blocked me and did the whole the whole nine yards kind of a thing. It's like, I, you know, you're not going to tell me the truth and get away with it. And so we just take it because we know they haven't come to understand yet. We, we used to be the very same thing because they think they're right. They've got a lot of investment in it, in themselves, in their time. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about their heart, their goodness, their entire lives as Sunday keepers, the church, their, which a lot of times is connected to their social life, just everything, sometimes even their job, everything. So that it's it's not easy. But the thing is, you know, as the very famous warning of Christ, what what good if you gain the whole world and lose your very eternal life? What are you, what are you gaining? Do you want to fry for a lie? A man wrote that a couple of weeks ago. Rather plain speaking individual. I can't write, I repeat a lot of what he said. But the thing is, in a sort of earthy sort of way, he was right. And he was actually a Sabbath keeper. So, you know, but he was... He was just sort of a good old boy who said things, says things in a way that he is accustomed to speaking in, and he was, the fact is he was right, even though a lot of his language is sort of unbiblical. But anyway, at least he's a lot closer than the very nice people who are Sunday keepers, which was my point. It takes a while, and unfortunately a lot of the people that we read of there that are going to fight, actually fight Christ, are going to be those very same sorts of people. The deception at that time is going to be so strong. But the good news is, time is on their side because there is an eternity coming, beginning with the first thousand years, beginning with the very actually first day in which those physical people are still alive on that day. If they're not called, they study on for resurrections. When will you be judged? Why it is that some will be, if you're a true Christian, will be resurrected as spirit or changed if you're alive that day to spirit, whereas the rest of the world is going to go on their way. The very famous rapture idea where someone is taken and the others are left. That's what that's talking about. It's not a rapture, it's just the return of Jesus Christ. And the ones who are left are the ones who haven't yet had their calling. Whereas the ones that were taken alive that day are going to be changed to spirit and meet the Lord in the air. And there they're going to be. And, you know, imagine if they happen to be someone of their own families. You know, this is another thing. If you happen to be one, just one in your family and you're called that day. They're not going to be able to deny it. Satan's going to be put away that day, so the satanic influence upon them is going to be gone. So suddenly it's going to be like a light switch being flipped on. And again, that's part of what those talk about there, where there's going to be no darkness. And you're going to be there, spiritually changed. Salvation will have happened to you, and you're going to be able to go to your own family, and they're going to see you change. It's, it's going to be very hard to deny, isn't it? for them. It's going to be so much easier for them. And then they're going to come along. But you have to be patient. You have to. It's not easy. I know it's not, but you have to be patient. But consider Zechariah 14, 16, and 19. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. There shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. It's a matter of freedom, isn't it? People are People don't have to accept salvation. If you don't want to live forever, you don't have to. You can choose condemnation if that's what you want because they're so deceived into their, their misapplied and faulty and phony Christianity that they don't love the truth. They just can't yet. But the Holy Spirit is going to wash that all away, that deception, that muck that's blocking the light for them. And then they're going to have a free chance. And the earthquakes themselves, you know, it's like a construction zone. It's a mess. The world as it is needs a lot of construction to be, because right now it's built upon really no foundation. It's built upon Satan's lies, which is nothing. He's a liar. A liar's, lies don't exist. But it, you look at, an, at a construction zone, it's a big. seems like a big mess. But the thing is, it isn't destruction that, that the ultimate goal is, even though what's there might have to be removed. 
but only to, to build something. And even the earthquakes themselves have a purpose. Not only to shake some sense into people, into humanity that really needs it, but to blow away all the things that are based upon all the idols. The world is so full of idols today. Statues everywhere. Not just religious, but political. They're everywhere. Those are going to crumble. Because the Lord said, don't make those things. Don't idolize things. Because, you know, people say, well, this is not religious. This is this has to do with history. He's our hero. But heroes are religious. The very word hero itself, as it's used in the Bible, were demigods. We'll put the link on for heroes. What that really means. It isn't about someone who's done some brave thing in service of one's country. Not that kind of a hero. But the original meaning of that term was pagan, is my point. So the earthquake is going to sort of just bring down the rubble in order for things to be built right now for the first time. And the earthquakes, ironically, are going to help make that happen. To bring down all the, the nonsense, all the, the, the rubble, that really, even when it's freestanding, it's still rubble. It's rubble even, even as it is before it falls. Because it's not built on anything that's really built. It's just thrown together, one lie upon another. Let's have a look at the New Testament about earthquakes. Consider the very famous Olivet Prophecy, and we'll put the link on for instructions to the end time church, because the Olivet Prophecy was a very big part of that, along with the teachings of things that he had already been teaching all through his ministry. But consider the part about earthquakes, Matthew 24, 3-13. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And to interject there, that can be taken both ways. Not only are there people who claim to be Jesus Christ, but to be claiming that Jesus was the Christ, but they're teaching another kind of Christianity. They've, they've taken something and just counterfeit it, counterfeited it in such a way that they're passing it off as Christian, and much of the Christian professing world is, is doing exactly that. And the greatest irony, the greatest tragedy, but not the greatest defeat, because those people just haven't had a chance yet, is that they don't realize it. That's the greatest part the most satanic deviousness of it, but only because the Lord has simply not given them the light yet. We all know what that's like. We all had our time before our conversion in which we were good Catholics or good Protestants of all the various kinds of Protestants. We weren't evil people. Well-meaning people, you know, we did the whole thing, but we just didn't know any better yet. And it wasn't a matter of our own fault. It wasn't because we didn't have the means of ourselves, we certainly we know we didn't change anything, but we were not yet given the Holy Spirit in order to really do to turn our hearts in the right direction and to really light up our hearts in a way that the light was there. But continue. Verse six, and you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And to interject there, we hear a lot of those wars and rumors of wars uh, beginning this week uh, is which is for the Western nations, war number three, beginning with Libya, although it's not quite on a ground war yet, but we'll see. Verse 7, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places, and these are the beginning of the sorrows. So to interject there again, it's not a matter of the Lord not allowing it or letting something that he doesn't want to have happen, but it's just a matter of letting things unravel as they are already unraveling anyway. I mean, even if God didn't exist, the world as it is built would fail because it's based upon things that don't last. Based upon lies. Based upon things that just weren't meant to last. They're made to last for the moment. They, they were instituted because they worked then. And tomorrow, well, we don't, we'll worry about that when we get to it. Well, tomorrow's here for a lot of those things and it's not a pretty picture because it was built upon like a house with no foundation. You can build a house pretty quick like that, but you know, you get some rain, or you get a little bit of winter, or you get some just the natural dampness of the ground, your house is going to crash. It's just not going to work. Verse 9 Then 
shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another and many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved and a lot of that waxing cold a lot of it is just a matter of keeping one's mouth from saying or from behaving in a way that others have been behaving towards us. We have to sort of bite our tongues and not respond nastily to people who speak bad about the Sabbath or bad about the holy days. And they feel so sorry for us because they think, well, you're stuck in the Old Testament or you're just one thing or the other. But they're the ones that don't yet get it. And there's nothing that you can say until the Holy Spirit enables them to hear you or rather to hear God's word. It's not going to make any difference. We can hear them loud and clear, you know, all their, their, their mistakes. and their, But it's it just not, they're not hearing us and they're not going to until the time comes. So you just have to be patient. And a lot of the persecutions as well, you know, a lot of that is going to be done. Uh, they're going to have good reason. It's not going to matter just people becoming vicious or even more vicious than they already are. But there's good reason for it. You know, people were tortured because they wanted to bring them around to the truth, to just get them to truth. And we'll just torture them long enough so they can come around to the truth. And the people of Judah were certainly subjected to that, into so-called Christianity, which meant Catholic Christianity, which wasn't the truth. And the true church of God as well, same thing. But consider earthquakes continuing. And oftentimes, as we read, one is going, a great earthquake is going to happen at the time of Christ's return. But you know, a great earthquake happened at the time of his crucifixion. Read here, Matthew 27, 50-56. Jesus, when he had cried again in a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And we'll put the link on for that study, giving up the ghost, exactly what that means. Continuing, verse 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And to interject it, we'll put on the study, the link for the study, why was it torn, referring to that curtain, into the holy place, and most holy place, continuing, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and again, put on the link for the study, through the gates of hell, and these people actually uh, were resurrected physical, that was not their salvation day, it was just a matter of proving those people would have died again, we'll put the link on for the study, resurrections. But they were an object lesson in the fact that resurrections are going to happen to everyone. Continuing, verse 53, And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there, beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And we'll put the link on for the study about the identity of those women. Mary Magdalene, everyone recognizes her. Mary, the mother of Jesus, James and Joseph, and also the mother of Zebedee's children, which was, and we'll put the link on for that, that's how John and Jesus were cousins. Matthew 28, 1-2, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. So even the earthquake was used to open the empty tomb, because the tomb was already empty at that time. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, early in the morning it was already empty. We put the link on for... The study, why observe the true Sabbath, just exactly when the resurrection happened, because it was not on a Sunday morning. The Bible plainly states that the tomb was already empty by that time. And Jesus didn't need the rock to be opened because he was spirit. He went right through it. But in order for the people to see in, those physical people, they had to have that rock rolled away. And another earthquake, consider Acts 16, 25-34, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And to inject there, that was the Apostle Paul. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed, and the keeper of the prison, awaiting, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. 
Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And to interject there, again, an earthquake, how it converted people. A couple of good examples there, how earthquakes are going to help put the fear of the Lord and therefore the love of the Lord's word into their hearts along with the Holy Spirit and are going to convert people. The centurion who was in charge of the very killing of Jesus Christ, became a believer because of the earthquake. This prison warden also became a believer from that time. Verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Interject there, big question. How is it answered? Verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. To now, to interject there, what some people take that to believe. Well, all you have to do is believe on the word, just accept Jesus. Well, no, that's not what he said. Because it, notice he said, Spake unto him the word of the Lord. That wouldn't have been necessary if all you had to know was the word Jesus, or accept him into your heart. We do have to accept him into our hearts by believing him, by obeying him. I'll put the link on for that study. Verse 33, And he, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized and all his straight away, and when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And isn't that amazing? And amazing, too, how much that man must have already known, because to be baptized, you have to know enough to really be able to do something about that baptism, because it's really a statement of repentance. And people who simply accept Jesus into their hearts without ever intending to do anything else aren't repenting. They're not doing anything. They're, they're still in the deception. But now looking into the future, consider in the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, 12 to 17, And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth, sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, to interject there are a couple of points. Every island was moved. Well, we saw that last week uh, with the Japan earthquake. The island of Japan was moved 17 feet. So, can it happen? What we just read in the Bible? Can every mountain and an island be moved? Well, we just saw an example of it in Japan last week. Continuing, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Answer, you can. All true Christians can. We don't have to run and hide on the day of Christ's returns. But these people, who yet haven't yet quite come to understand, or don't understand at all, hopefully for their own good, because once you know better, you got to do better, but they're going to run and hide for the wrath that's coming upon them because of the evil, and in most cases, unknowing evil, innocent evil, that they've been doing. But like the earthquake of the centurion or that jailer, these people, they're going to get the message loud and clear. They're going to understand that no, humans are not more powerful than, than God. And yes, God really does exist. And they're going to hide in their bunkers and their holes in the ground like rats. Saying, hide us from him who is coming, who is all powerful. They're going to get the message on that day. They're going to have the arrogance crushed out of them. Because you know the old saying, if you don't get humility for yourself, the Lord's going to give it to you. He's going to give you some humility too. But again, for your own good. Do you see why the wrath is there? Because those majority of people at that time are not truly evil yet. You're evil when you know better. You can do evil. You can be deceived into doing evil. Going to church on Sunday and claiming it to be the Christian Sabbath is evil. It's a sin. It's a violation of the fourth commandment. But the most people, 99.99% .99 of the people who do it, aren't bad people. They're deceived people. They're well-meaning people. They think they're Christian. In a lot of cases, ironically, they live a more Christian life than a lot of people who do understand the truth because it's easier for them, ironically, because if Satan's got you going to church on Sunday and living a Christian life and being an example of what false Christianity is all about, Satan's not going to mess with you. He's not going to bother you. But you try observing the Sabbath, and Satan's going to throw everything he's got at you. 
He's going to do everything he can to make you look bad in the eyes of the world. Whereas going to church on Sunday, he's going to shine you up real nice for all the world to see. And that's part of the reason it's going to seem so right to do so wrong to God's true people until that time. Including what's going to happen to the last two prophets, the last two human prophets in this world prior to the day of Christ's return. The last witnesses of the gospel, Revelation 11, 7 to 13, another earthquake coming here. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. To interject there, they're not going to go down easy from the way this is read. We know that they have the power to defend themselves throughout their 42 months of their ministry. And apparently, from the sound of this, the way it's described here, they're not just going to be killed. They're going to go down with hellfire flying from the read of it as we read this. Make war against them. It doesn't just say kill them. And shall overcome them. It doesn't just say kill them. Without any kind of defense. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And to interject there, I heard from, I, I shouldn't have mentioned it, I guess. I mentioned, I think, last week, two weeks ago. In the 15 years we've been online for daily Bible study, I've heard from now over, I know it's over 100 sets of or single people or sets of people who claim to be the two witnesses. I heard from one last week, and as I always don't do, I didn't reply because... Well, I don't think they really are. Because if you read what the two witnesses are, their ministry, there won't even be any two witnesses until their miraculous ministry begins. Then they're the two witnesses. And they are, in fact, the only, as such, they're the only time indicator of when Christ's return is going to happen. As we mentioned in our news article, people make uh, prophecies of when Christ's return is going to happen. No one can do that. If Christ's two witnesses have not begun their ministry, and they're not, so they don't even exist yet as far as being two witnesses, so how can someone be the two witnesses? But 42 months after their ministry begins, with great miracles, then Christ's return will happen. And look what happens. They'll have to defend themselves, and then they're going to be killed. But look what will happen to them. Verse 10, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Stop there. Two prophets preaching the truth, and the world was tormented by it. Isn't that sad? That people are tormented by truth. Truth. But they just find it so difficult. Just like Satan. It shows how much there is of Satan's spirit in them, because Satan is tormented by the truth. Continuing, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. That could be the earthquake that splits the Mount of Olives, because that's talking about Jerusalem. We know the two witnesses are going to be killed in Jerusalem, martyred. The city there is obviously Jerusalem. Great earthquake. It's either one or a foreshock, a foreshock, if you will, of the greatest one yet to come, because we know there's going to be one more at the return of Jesus Christ, which may be the one that split it. But again, this is talking specifically about Jerusalem. Whether it's going to split there, we don't know how much time there will be between that their resurrection of the two witnesses in Christ's return. It could be a, a day or two. We don't know. But that could be the one that split it, splits the Mount of Olives. But if it isn't, this one will be. Revelation 16, 17 to 20. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. So that is going to be a big one, isn't it? And it's going to smooth the earth. It's going to make 
a place of habitation, of righteousness, because as we said, in, in order to build something, you usually have to tear down what's there and is in the way sort of a thing, and the world right now is in the way of the kingdom of God, the way it's been built, because all these human kingdoms through the earthquakes themselves are going to have a purpose. Should you fear them as a true Christian? Well, you should take reasonable precautions. If you live, particularly if you live somewhere where there are earthquakes, there's it, nothing wrong with, as we read in our these suggestions here from FEMA, you know, at being ready to look after your family and your home. And, but as far as fearing the wrath at the end, those those great earthquakes, no, the Lord's going to take care of you until that time. You needn't worry. We need to be prepared, but we need not worry or be afraid of something that's natural and yet supernatural. Or rather, because if you look at the, what's natural, you know, the human, as we are created as physical, we'll put the link on for that study as well, we are created physically by means of spirit. So getting back to what really created us is spirit. It's just a matter we're in this particular state now, just in case we say no to salvation, then we can be erased. Whereas with spirit, you can't anymore. It'd be like Satan, he's going to be put in a black cage, lightless cage, forever. And that's unfortunate, considering he was once the light bringer. You know, the tragedy of that. So humans, at least, are not going to have to share his fate. There is no ever-burning hell, but there is just an, an ever-oblivion oblivion for those who refuse to accept. But it's going to be so much easier. You know, if you look at all the, not only the physical things, earthquakes and everything, but the Holy Spirit, once it comes, it's going to get easy for people, for humanity. And the understanding as much and more and more as we can of the Word of God, of the truth, and of everything that's coming, it's just going to make it easier. It's not going to make it easier to live through it. But, you know, you can endure a lot when you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, number one. You know how long it's going to last. As we said, once the two witnesses appear, it's 42 months before they will be martyred, and Christ's return will be very shortly after that. So, it's easy, isn't it, once you understand. Easier, once you understand. Even things like earthquakes, even though for those who must endure devastation of them, it's not easy. But the, you see the point of what's easy. No matter no matter how you live your life, you're going to endure trouble and, and trouble. It's just the way it is. That's part of this physical condition. We're born to die physically. But the only reason we're born to die is because we can get to live forever if we make the right choice while we're yet physical. Thy kingdom is coming. And the earthquakes have a purpose in that. Part of that construction over the world that is yet to come. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.